Good morning, well, wherever you are, good afternoon or good morning. I'm Father Chris Alar, coming to you live from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where it's a cloudy day, but at least not as hot, so I hopefully won't be sweating to death today, but I'm excited to be back with you for the third and final uh, episode, if you will, on our explaining the end times. And this is an opportunity for us to give you true teaching of what the church says will happen at the end. I'm very excited because, um, yes, I've gotten a lot of comments saying, Father, you're wrong on this or wrong on that. This hasn't been my teaching, and it is the teaching of the church. And so please understand that everything I'm going to give you is a beautiful summary of the church's teaching on what's going to happen before the end when Christ comes. This is an opportunity for us to learn. Um, I'm excited because I've worked diligently for hours. I was up to four o'clock this morning um, working with theologians, uh, with priests, uh, doing research, reading, and, and studying, so that what I'm about to give you is a summary of what the Catholic Church teaches about from all mystics and saints, but approved by the church, what they say will happen regarding the end times. So thank you for staying with us. This is a very important talk. And let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to bless our time, open our minds and hearts to the grace you wish to bestow, to educate us, to know what we need to know regarding preparation for the second coming of our Lord. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so on your first slide, you can see we're doing a continuation of our talks. Um, part of this whole series goes back or ties to explaining the faith. This is a series on DVD that you can get either on hard copy DVD, visiting shopmercy.org, or if you like, shopmercy.org slash Saturdays, where we've had all our products. But you can also live stream it on the Divine mercy.org slash explaining the faith. So I hope that you'll get that. All right. The first slide that we're going to show is a continuation of last week, the four last things. On this slide, you'll see last week, and you can find this video online, we already co covered death and judgment, but today we'll be covering or finishing with heaven and hell, and that will finish the four last things, and then I'm going to summarize for you the entire summary of the teachings of the church saints regarding what will happen before the end and the coming of our Lord. All right, let's start with the first slide, heaven. All right, so here we go. This is our goal, right? Everybody wants to join us together someday eternally in heaven. And remember, as the Baltimore Catechism states, we're meant for heaven. We are meant to be saved. And so here is what we see the church on our next slide. This is our church telling us what heaven will be like. Quote, those who die in God's grace and friendship and are perfectly purified, whether in this life or in the next life in purgatory, which we'll explain next week, live forever with Christ. They are like God forever, for they see him as he is face to face. And that's from the church teaching. Now, what's interesting here, what does it mean to see God face to face? The Bible says that no man has seen the face of God and lived. Yes, but the Bible also says we will see God. And this is what scripture tells us in Revelation 22, 4. Now, Tim Staples, a good Catholic theologian, um, I'm going to borrow from him because he says a very good kind of summary on heaven. He says, that this doesn't mean we will see God with our physical eyes. 
when we shall see the face of God. He says, obviously, God is pure spirit, so rather we'll see him with our intellectual minds. Now, the saints see, if you will, quote unquote, the divine essence with a directly informed or intuited intellectual vision. What does this mean? All right, this is what we call the beatific vision. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Seeing God as he, as he is once we behold him in heaven. And what's interesting is Staples explains, Tim Staples, that the church obviously teaches that heaven is more primarily a state of being rather than a physical place. So the beatific vision, he says, isn't just people sitting around looking at God and then turning their eyes away from God. Um, it's not like that. What he says, and I'm going to read his own quote, as he says, the blessed will be in a state of contemplation of God that is constant. <clears throat> he said, heaven is principally a state of utter and absolute fulfillment. In the possession of God in the beatific vision, the blessed, that's you and me hopefully someday, will experience what cannot be put into words a radical union with God that transcends anything we can envision. He says, and it is precisely because of that radical union with God in Christ that the blessed will also experience a union with each other, your loved ones, in union and other members of the body of Christ that go way beyond our ability to even imagine. Isn't that a cool explanation of heaven, right? Now, often I hear people say, well, Father, I'll never be happy in heaven if all my children aren't there or my brothers and sisters aren't there. I will never be happy. I need them to get there. Well, this is true. We do need them to get there. But look at your next slide. What does Revelation 21.4 say? It's a promise. Revelation 21.4 is a promise that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, meaning us, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Wow, since obviously missing our loved ones would really fall under the category of pain or mourning, which God promises that he'll wipe away, we won't be sad in heaven. Now, he promises that he'll wipe away even those tears and all mourning. So our focus should be bringing our loved ones to Christ and praying for them now in this world so that they will be there in heaven when we get there or visiting us or coming with us or after us, rather than worrying about whether or not we are happy if they're there or not. So it's a mystery beyond our comprehension. Now, we also have testimony of the saints who have a lot to say about heaven. And I'm gonna read you from St. Faustina a, break, a quick clip from diary number 777. What does St. Faustina say? She says, today I was in heaven in spirit and I saw inconceivable beauties and the happiness that awaits us after death. I saw how all creatures give ceaseless praise and glory to God. I saw how great is happiness in God, which spreads to all creatures, making them so happy. And then all the glory and praise which springs from this happiness returns to its source, right? That's God himself. And they enter into the depths of God, contemplating the inner life of God, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whom they will never fully comprehend or fathom. Just love. Isn't that amazing? This source of happiness is unchanging in its essence, but it is always new. So in other words, you're not going to get bored. People have asked me, Father, am I going to get bored in heaven? Just staring at God all day? No, you will not. It will always be new, gushing forth happiness for all creatures. Now I understand St. Paul who said, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of any man what God has prepared for those who love him. Powerful, huh? The Bible says, and we have to remember to receive this beauty that St. Faustina just explained, it's not automatic. It takes a lot of work. The Bible tells us we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But we can get there. The only thing is the Bible tells us no one imperfect in love. That's why God says you must be perfect like the heavenly, his heavenly, our heavenly father is perfect. Not meaning you don't make mistakes, but perfect in love. So the Bible says anyone imperfect in love cannot enter heaven because God is perfect in love. So that doesn't mean that we will not get into heaven if we have the slightest flaw. No. Next week, we're going to talk about purgatory. Please join us because next week in purgatory, we'll explain if we are flawed, how God gives mercy through a way to cleanse us and to prepare us to enter into heaven. The Bible says, unless we are, if we have any stain, we can't enter. Now, what happens if you don't believe in purgatory? That means you must think you're going to hell if you have any stain then. Well, no, I don't, Father. Well, the Bible tells you if you have any stain, you're not getting into heaven. So where else would you go but hell? Thank the Lord we have purgatory. And we're going to explain to you next week why it's actually biblical. I know I got a lot of comments from you that, Father, it's not biblical. Please join me next week as we're going to talk about why it is. All right. So this doesn't mean that all flawed people will automatically go to hell. We're all flawed, right? And so often, as I said, purgatory is needed to cleanse us of these defects and attachments. So again, please join us next week. However, What we're going to finish with today is the next slide, which none of us want to talk about, but is a reality and we need to talk about, and that is hell. You know, ironically, hell exists, believe it or not, because God is love. This is true. God is love, and God desires the free love from his creatures. That's us. Now, if he forced us to love him, then we wouldn't be giving him true love. We would be robots. Love, in order to be true, has to be free. And it cannot be forced. It has to be offered and received willingly. That's why free will is one of our greatest gifts. So, in that case, the choice not to love must be a possibility just like the choice to love is a possibility. So with free will, God gives us the choice to love him, but he also, because he's love and gives us free will, has to give us the choice not to love him. We were made in the image and likeness of God, all right? And we were patterned after the Trinity who lives in love. We talked about this last week. Now, if we refuse to love God or our neighbor, right, we are denying our very nature, which is love. Because the nature of the Trinity is love and we're patterned in the image and likeness of God. So we are to love or we're failing in living our very nature as human beings. Now, we, if we do that, are denying the very thing that will fulfill us and answer 
our deepest desires. People are always like, Father, why am I not fulfilled? It's all about love. This is an opportunity for us to learn how to love even greater. Okay. In the case that we deny ourselves that love and choose not to love, especially God or our neighbor, we're setting ourselves up for hell. This, in many ways, is the heart of what hell is. Not loving God or neighbor. It's a separation from God for all eternity. This is very powerful and very important. What is it? All right, people always say, Father, what am I understanding hell to be? What, what is it? Well, remember, God doesn't send any one of us to hell. We choose it, again, with our free will, as we just talked about. But remember, evil, which we experience or will uh, from the saints if we read them, uh, is really what evil is personified, is hell. But Evil, as I explained a couple talks ago, is not a real created thing. Evil is a lack, a privation of the good. So as I said before, when we pull God, who is goodness itself, out of our courts, out of our schools, out of our families, we are pulling out goodness itself. We are removing goodness itself. And so when we remove God, who is goodness itself, we have a lack of the good. And the result is evil. That is what hell is. A privation of God and therefore a privation or lack of the good. So remember, even though God is love, he will respect our free will choice. Our choice to love him or not. Even though he loves us and always will, we may refuse to reciprocate and choose hell. Remember, hell is real. C.S. Lewis said that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. Think about that. The gates of hell are locked from the inside. This explains why a merciful God would allow a soul to go to hell. He doesn't send them, they choose it, but he allows it. Some souls, we don't know any particular souls. Father, are there souls in hell? Church teaching is yes, there are souls in hell. Mary told us that. But we do not know any particular soul is in hell. Believe it or not, we don't even know if Hitler was, is in hell. I know you're going to probably write to me and say, Father, that's crazy, and you're probably right. But the church does not teach any particular soul is in hell. We know souls are in hell. But you never know if he could have had a brain tumor. Um, you know, the, there was a shooting in the University of Texas back in the 1960s where a man climbed a bell tower and shot several students. And the police actually then shot this man. Everybody was condemning him to hell. Uh, rightfully so, they were angry. But they found a brain tumor in this man after the autopsy or during the autopsy that was the size of a golf ball. And so this brain tumor may have obviously affected his free will. And the only way we go to hell is to die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. And mortal sin, one of the conditions is free will. So we have to understand that's why God judges people. We do not. We can judge actions, but not people. Only God knows the heart. All right. So God allows some souls to go to hell. Why? Because in their own twisted way, they want to be there. Their hatred of God would make them miserable serving him in heaven. Right? This is why, um, you know, we always think of Satan saying, I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. And every soul who goes there is basically saying the same thing. I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. This is not the answer. We want to be fulfilled in happiness, and that only comes fully being united with God. All right, let's keep going. So how does this come about, If whether you go to heaven or hell, what we just talked about? Our particular judgment. Now, 
how this happens in a soul that does end up in the depths of hell for eternity is that the unjust, just like the just, will rise from the dead on the last day. And we're going to talk about that called the general judgment. And the body is united with the soul. And in the case of the damned, a darkened body will be united with the soul. In the case of the just, a lightened body, fully illuminated, will be united with the soul, or with the body with the soul. Those who are darkened, those bodies that have been united with the souls that have chosen not to follow God, will be damned by their own choices. Now, instead of the spirit controlling the body, which the souls in heaven will have, in hell, the body controls the spirit in full carnal ways. This is very scary. Appetites are never satisfied and will never be quenched. The more sin, the darker the body that the person has experienced. This is very scary to me. You know, um, the main pain in hell is the pain of knowing the loss uh, or, or I should say is the pain of loss of knowing what you long, no longer have for all eternity, God himself. Basically what hell is and the worst pain of hell is that realization of what you've lost for all eternity. But there's also the pain of the senses. You know, knowing what you've lost for all eternity in God hurts so bad because the reason you were created was to be with God but you also have the pains of the senses. In Mark chapter nine, verse four says, the worm dies not. And the other pain is the pain of sense. So I'm gonna to read to you a paragraph from St. Faustina's diary that explains a little bit about what hell is. This is paragraph 741. St. Faustina says, today I was led by an angel to the chasms of hell. It was a place of great torture. How awesomely large and extensive it is. The kinds of torture I saw were this. The first torture that constitutes hell is the loss of God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience. The third is the one's condition will never change. And fourth is fire that will penetrate the soul without destroying it. A terrible suffering, since it is a purely spiritual fire lit by God's anger. The fifth is torture. The fifth torture is continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devils and the souls of the damned see each other and all the evil, both of others and their own. The sixth torture is the constant company of Satan. The seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses, and blasphemies. These are the tortures suffered by all the damned together, but that is not the end of the sufferings, oh my. There are special tortures destined for those particular souls. These are the torment of the senses. Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable, indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. So if your sin was gluttony, you're going to be perhaps for all eternity forced, fed to the point of you can't take it, the foods that you indulged in to an improper way um, or whatever senses you chose to sin by. If they were sexual sins, then you will be tortured in that manner. Now, there are caverns and pits of torture where one form of agony differs from another. I would have died at the very sight of these tortures if the omnipotence of God had not supported me. Let the sinner know that he will be tortured throughout all eternity in those senses which he made use of to sin. I am writing this at the command of God so that no soul may find an excuse by saying there is no hell. 
or that nobody has ever been there. And so no one can say what it is like. I, Sister Faustina, by the order of God, have visited the abyss of hell so that I might tell souls about it and to testify to its existence. I cannot speak about it now, but I have received a command from God to leave it in writing. The devils were full of hatred for me, but they had to obey me at the command of God. What I have written is but a pale shadow of the things I saw, but I noticed one thing, and this is interesting, that most of the souls there are those who disbelieved that there is a hell. So in other words, most souls in hell are souls that didn't believe either in God or in hell. When I came to, I could hardly recover from the fright how terrible souls suffer there. Consequently, I pray more fervently for the conversion of sinners. I incessantly plead for God's mercy upon them. Oh my Jesus, I would rather be in agony until the end of the world and miss the greatest sufferings than offend you by the least slightest sin. Wow, pretty scary, huh? Don't mean to scare you, but that is what the reality is. All right, let's finish up with hell here. Even if a person were so wretched in this world, this would not have to be your destiny. If you simply say you're sorry, repent, turn back to God, you have a chance to encounter and accept Christ who is mercy itself. You know, the diary of St. Faustina, in paragraph 1486, Jesus says that he comes to the soul three times and gives the soul the opportunity to receive him and still accept his mercy. This is incredible. The problem is if we've lived our life rejecting God, we might, not, we might not recognize him when he comes. So we have to recognize him when he comes by recognizing him in this world. Remember Jesus said, I will deny before the Father those who denied me in this world. So we please, we need to pray. So at least at the end of their lives, our loved ones will accept that mercy of God. And in paragraph 1698, Jesus says, when it looks like all hope is lost and souls who were away from the faith are dying, it looks like it's all lost, but he's saying it's not so. Many of these souls are given God's grace and turned back to him. And the biggest way to make that happen is your prayers. So please remember that. All right, so the key to remember is it's the devil who desires your damnation. God wants anything to do to save you. So the evil one who wants your damnation will accuse you of your sins. He wants to see you damned along with him. So remember to confess your sins in the confessional. This is what the saints all tell us. Confess sins cannot be brought back up, even by Satan. And so confess, get them away, get them cleaned. All right, now, God sent obviously his only son, to save us, not damn us, to open the gates to heaven, not to throw us into hell. And so all we have to do is say yes to God. He is love. Just say yes to that love. He loves all of us and desires that we all be saved. Now again, that doesn't mean all of us will be saved. That's universalism. That's a heresy. Because there are souls in hell and once there you can't get out. But we are talking today about this so we're not one of them. God wants us to be saved. And some obviously will reject this and not be saved, and he has to honor that as free will. So we are first and foremost responsible for our own salvation, nobody else's but ours first. Then, after we do that, we help intercede and get others to heaven. The salvation of souls is the greatest thing that we can do in our lifetime. But it has to start with ours first, then worry about the others. It's kind of like on the airplane, right, where they always give you that talk that the mask that falls, if there's an event of an emergency, you have to put the mask on yourself first and then help others. That's a purpose so that you can help others. 
People say, well, that's not, that's selfish, Father. No, you got to help yourself be in the right frame or state so then you can help others. It's the same with your soul. Get your soul right, get your soul on its way to heaven, then you can help others get to heaven. But yourself first, all right? So we then try to aid our brothers and sisters through that intercessory prayer. All right, now we are going to get into the good stuff. The five signs, what I have done over the last several weeks is to give you, and I'm about to summarize it right now. A couple talks ago, I gave you the five signs in scripture of the coming of Christ at the end of time. You remember those? One was that the Bible has to be uh, spread to all corners of the world, which we think you know, we're doing now with the internet. Two, that there would be a great apostasy or turning away from the faith, which we talked about in scripture, talks in scripture, and we're seeing a lot of that today. Third would have to be a conversion of the Jews back to Jesus, which Cardinal Ratzinger says we have not seen yet, but could come soon. Then there would be the coming of the Antichrist and then a great tribulation um, before the end when Jesus comes. Those were from scripture. If you remember those five signs I gave you, but now I'm about to summarize for you all the saints. What did the saints say also in addition to those five signs will come before the end so that you and I can prepare for it. All right, these signs or what I call stages come from the saints, the tradition of the saints. Please don't think I'm giving you my opinion here. I have researched this, studied, as I said, talked to theologians and priests and other people. And we have summarized what the basic, if you were to take and study all the saints and the mystics that have talked about the end and summarize it together, you get these five basic stages. Now, I'm pulling from great saints like Saint Caesar of Arles from the sixth century, Saint Anselm, Thomas Becket, Saint Hildegard, um, all of these, and she was one of the few females to get papal approbation. This is powerful stuff. I'm not making it up. Please don't sit, you know, there thinking, I'm giving you false teaching, I'm giving you church teaching, okay? So let's start with the first slide, all right? The first slide is a time of great and unprecedented sin. I think you could say we have ways to sin now like we've never had before. We have ways to sin now that I think with internet on demand, pornography on demand, uh, texting, and all the other ways that we sin now. Pope Pius XII, back in the 1950s, said that mankind is more sinful today than he was even at the time of the flood. And that was the 1950s, right? Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> So this is, I believe, a time we are seeing right now unprecedented sin. I don't need to explain this. I think you know it. Look at this next one. Slide two. A time of minor chastisement. This minor chastisement or a minor apostasy is mainly what we're seeing right now. And it goes along with the signs in scripture that I told you about a couple weeks ago. This minor apostasy is gripping the West Western Europe and here in America, uh, loss of faith and belief in God. Um, we're also seeing in this minor chastisement, natural disasters, hurricanes are up, um, you know, um, uh, storms and, and, and you know, uh, typhoons, wars are up, devastation of our civilizations, overthrows of governments, rioting, civil unrest. We're seeing all this, confusion in the church, we're really seeing that. Other punishments to the church for infidelity um, and the whole world, uh, punishments to the whole world for the evil that she's committed. A lot of suffering. The errors of Russia that have been spread because we didn't do the consecration in time. We'll talk about that more later. This may include the three days of darkness and many people, the saints tell us, will perish during this three days. This is, remember, I got comments on this, this is the end of an age, not the end of the world, 
Okay, I am not up here trying to tell you, Father Chris is not saying the world is ending. I didn't say that. <clears throat> Several people told me I said that. I didn't. It's the end of an age, not the end of the world, because there's more to come, as you'll hear. This stage, though, here's what's important, is completely conditional. In other words, all of this doesn't have to happen. If we simply pray and turn back to God, if we simply do what Mary has been telling us at places like Fatima and Akita, we'll talk about that more. Things like that we have our understanding that um, prayer, penance, sacrifice, um, turning back to God. If we do this, we have the power, the saints tell us, to stop some of this chastisement. You have the power to change human history by praying, fasting, making a difference for the world to come. Yes, but Father, everything's under the providence of God. Yes, it does. But Pope Benedict told us scripture, or excuse me, prophecy. Prophecy is not, unlike scripture, written in stone. Prophecy, Mary says, for instance, if, if you don't do this, then this will happen. Or if you do this, then this will happen. So if you pray the rosary and turn back to God, we will avoid war. And see, these are things you have the power to do. I do too. I'm really, really, really taking this seriously, and I hope you are too. All right, let's look at the next stage, stage three. This is the era of peace, <clears throat> the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Many of you asked me, Father, in your talk last week, where was the triumph of the Immaculate Heart? Remember, I was teaching you scripture. Scripture was what I was teaching. And in the scripture passage, we don't have the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. That was revealed later. But now we know about it. The saints talk about it. It's a restoration. This stage is a restoration of Christianity. A triumph of the Immaculate Heart, where all hearts with her will be made immaculate through the church. All right, at Fatima, Mary assures us that in the end, her Immaculate Heart will triumph and will usher in a new era of peace and spread Christ's reign. Now, <clears throat> in this time period, Satan will be chained again. Now, we ask at the end, what is going to happen? Well, one of the things is it will talk about Satan being chained. Now, we don't know if this is the end of his 100-year reign, which I'm going to talk to you in a minute, which uh, Pope Leo overheard a conversation where Satan told God that he needed 100 years to bring down his church, and Jesus actually granted him that. Um, we don't know if that 100 years was from 1884 to 1984, which was the year 1884 that Christ and uh, Satan had that conversation overheard by Leo the 13th, or perhaps 1917, all right, where many things happen, and again, we're going to get to that. All right, but in this stage, we will have a great pope and a great world leader who the saints call a monarch. Could be a king, it might be a great diplomat or a great leader, but they will unite the nations that were previously devastated and reestablish Christianity. Some say that he will come from France, which makes sense because France is the first daughter of the church and has fallen away. And it makes sense because in the Bible it teaches us what seems barren and seems impossible to bear fruit does in fact bear fruit, like Elizabeth in her womb with John the Baptist. All right? Now, Jews and Muslims will convert to Christ. Now, remember, the church does not teach here that world governments will bring about an end to evil, like the UN or the European Union. Uh-uh. Um, cooperation and those things will not necessarily bring about the end of evil. We don't know how this will happen or how long this will last. All the nations, however, the saints tell us, will recognize the Holy Church of Rome, the Catholic Church, and the extended prosperity, though this is the drawback, just like we've seen in our world many times, the extended prosperity will cause many people to become lax and lose their faith. 
um, and a sense that they need God. You know, one of the reasons God allows uh, suffering and God allows us to sometimes fall into poverty is because then we have a, ne- a sense of need for him. When we have everything we ever need, we don't need God. And so sometimes he lets us go without or suffer loss so that we can recognize our need for God. All right. If people respond to God's grace, the saints tell us, this age will be extended for centuries, even a millennium. Now, this might be where some people are confused about the thousand year reign of Christ, which I said will not happen after Jesus comes again. There has been an establishment of the reign of Christ through his church already on earth. What I taught a few weeks ago, and yes, not all Protestants believe this. When I said that non-Catholics believe this, I meant some non-Catholics, that Christ will come and then establish a thousand year reign. That's not church teaching. Church teaching is that Christ has already established his reign through the church. And sometimes a thousand years just is is um, idiomatic for a long time. This is what we have here. All right. This reign of peace will be ushered in with the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The saints tell us, and depending on how we respond to God's grace will depend on how long this lasts. This is important. All right, now, the next slide. The time of Christianity will then erode and give away to the Antichrist. This is called the Great Chastisement or the Great Tribulation. It's the final era era of testing. Uh, There will be a great worldwide apostasy meaning a falling away from God and the faith even greater than before. The last Antichrist will come, the Antichrist. We've had others that are um, of the Antichrist like Nero or Hitler or Napoleon, but this is the Antichrist that will come at the end. He will come claiming God-like powers. He will seize complete control, and he begins a a three-and-a-half-year persecution of the church. And that will lead to the church's decline. But however, the church has an answer. You remember Elijah and Enoch? Elijah and Enoch never died. Remember it said they were assumed into heaven. What does that mean? I never knew that, Father. Yes, what that means is they have not died yet. So scripture tells us that and all the saints about Elijah and Enoch, and here's what the saints say. They will come back and do battle with the Antichrist, but they will be killed by him. Please don't write me letters and saying I'm a heretic. This is the saints telling us this. All right. The forces of the Antichrist will kill Elijah and Enoch. They have to die their first death. Don't worry, they'll be resurrected at the final judgment. And it is through their preaching that the Jews will be converted. This will be seven years, and the worst of it, it's awesome that there's conversion, but the tribulation of the Antichrist will reign. The three and a half last years will be the worst, and it is a very bad persecution, a time of great suffering. But after that, people will start to realize the wrongness of following the Antichrist, and conversions will start to happen. The church will endure great persecution and actually appeared to have died just like Jesus, her groom. Remember, the church is the bride. And the church will appear just like Jesus to have died. It will resemble her groom. That's what the church has always been, the bride of Christ. And Jesus says the bride must resemble her groom. Now, Christ will later come, though, and kill the Antichrist. No, Father, you're making that up. No, that's 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. This is what it says. And a time will be given for those people who were affected by the Antichrist to convert and turn back to God. Tradition says this will not be a long time. And so it's important. Now, next will come the coming of Christ and judgment as the Middle Ages saints used to say, doomsday. But I like to look at it better. Let's go to the final slide. The era of general judgment. The fifth stage. Here, the Trinity will come upon the earth and all creation 
will melt with fire and become spiritualized into a new earth. But being melting with fire actually, <clears throat> in this case, isn't terrifying. What do you mean, Father? Well, it's like the glorification of Christ. You know, on the shroud, we kind of see that image burnt into the shroud, like this burst of light that came with his glorification. This is what will happen. This will be, there will be a fire that becomes a spiritualized fire, right? And onto the earth. And this glorification is like Christ. Christ comes in glory to judge the living and the dead, and the dead will arise, the sheep and goats will be separated, hell will be opened, and all the demons and the goats will be thrown in, and hell will be sealed. And the rest will live with God for all eternity in heaven. This is powerful stuff. Let's go to the next slide and see what St. Faustina told us about this. St. Faustina said, Mary told her, determined is the day of justice, the day of divine wrath. Now remember, only the Father knows this. The angels tremble before it. Speak to souls about this great mercy while it is still the time for granting mercy. If you keep silent now, you will be answering for a great number of souls on that terrible day, but fear nothing. Be faithful to the end. I sympathize with you. That's Mary talking to St. Faustine in the diary 635. And so we see how that end will be. But now what I want to do is look at particular parts of those five stages in what will happen. I just gave you an overview, but let's look at one of those things that happened in stage two. Stage two was a minor chastisement. One of the things that will happen is your next slide. <clears throat> the saints tell us an illumination of conscience and three days of darkness. Now, St. Faustina actually experienced a personal illumination of conscience. Let's first talk about that. She said she was summoned to God's throne. And she said after a moment, his wounds disappeared. All his scourging, all that remained were the five wounds of his two in his hands, one in his side, and two in his feet. Now, she said, I saw the complete condition of my soul as God sees it, I could clearly see all that was displeasing to God. She said, I did not know that even the smallest little transgression will have to be accounted for. That's pretty scary in my book. Wow. How, she said, how or how can I describe it? I do not know to stand before God, the almighty God. Wow, that's diary passage number 36. So there will be an illumination of conscience where God will allow us to see ourselves as he sees us. And hopefully that'll bring about conversions. Now, Faustina and the Bible also talk about a time of darkness, but it's not three days necessarily. This comes from private revelation, the three days part of it. Darkness is in scripture. Exodus 10 talks about the ninth plague, uh, uh, the plagues of, of Egypt being the time of darkness. There's, there's a mention of that. St. Faustina talks about a time of darkness where only light will be the cross in the sky and darkness will overcome the land. But it doesn't say three days. That comes from private revelation. All right, this is important. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. Blessed Mary of Jesus crucified who died in 1878. She said, during a darkness lasting three days, so again, the three days comes from private revelation, not from scripture. Darkness is in scripture, but it doesn't say how long. Blessed Mary of Jesus crucified said, during a darkness lasting three days, the people will be given to evil, or who were given to evil, meaning you chose a life of sin, will perish so that one-fourth of mankind will survive. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to show you what the saints are teaching us to change our lives and repent. Let's look at the next slide. 
Blessed Anna Maria Taigi. She said, quote, and look at her picture there, amazing. All the enemies of the church, secret as well as known, will perish over the whole earth during that universal time of darkness, with the exception of a few who God will soon afterward convert. The air shall be infected by demons who will appear under all sorts of hideous forms. All right? It happens at the end of the minor chastisement, but it's a mercy, the mercy of God to end that time of chastisement. It actually comes at the end of that stage two I showed you, but God does it as a mercy, a mercy. So this is powerful. Now, a couple more. Marie de la Fraude in the 20th, early 20th century said, there will come three days of complete darkness only blessed candles made of wax will give some light during horrible darkness. Now, here's what's interesting. One candle will last all three days. So you don't have to worry about going out and buying a one candle that's 12 hours, one candle that's four hours, one candle that's 20 hours, and trying to add up to three days. This saint tells us if they're made of wax they will burn the entire three days. So you can now order from us. We have on our website, shopmercy.org slash Saturday. We have candles that are beautiful beeswax candles, liturgical beeswax candles, which is liturgical candles that I will personally bless for you, that you can get by visiting shopmercy.org slash Saturday. And, or you want to call 1-800, the number four, Marion, and you can get it as well. So please think about that. Nothing will put out these blessed candles once they are lit during the three days of darkness. She says they will burn throughout. So these prophecies also are conditional meaning that we don't have to go through this. Anybody who tells you the three days of darkness have to happen no matter what, they're set in stone, so just live the life you wanna live, is wrong. The saints tell us that if we turn back to God, pray and repent, we too, we too can change the effect of the days of darkness. This is incredible. It's how much we cooperate with God's grace. All right, so what is the next slide? How do we persevere through this, through these tough times? The answer is divine mercy and Mary. That's what we Marians are all about. We are about Mary and divine mercy. That's why we're called the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, but we were the first men's community to bear the name Mary of the Immaculate Conception, her title, but also we spread divine mercy. So. It's very powerful. The next slide, you want to help us in this mission to save souls, to help change the world, to avoid this chastisement, and even quite possibly the days of darkness, according to the saints, join our army. There's no cost. There's, no, there's no, nothing that you can't do but benefit. Go to M-I-C for Marians of the Immaculate Conception, prayers.com and join us, share in the charism of us Marian fathers, of Mary and divine mercy. Join our army praying for an end to evil in the world, an end to chastisement by turning back to God through prayer and fasting. This is the answer, divine mercy and Mary. So let's look at our next slide. Here we see the image of divine mercy. What makes it so powerful? It's mankind's last hope of salvation. Faustina said that this, Jesus told St. Faustina, I should say, that divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. Faustina said mankind will not have peace until it turns with trust to God's mercy. He said if we don't pass through the doors of his mercy, we must pass through the doors of his justice. You've heard me say, I don't know about you, but I'm not making it through the doors of justice. We need the doors of mercy. He is giving us now a time of mercy, 
But after that, he says, will come a time of justice. So don't miss this boat. So divine mercy is the first key here. And that's what we Marians focus on, divine mercy. But we also do it with the other spiritual weapon, Mary. Let's look at our next slide. What is the message of Mary? A lot of people you wrote to me, Father, why don't you talk about Akita, La Salette, um, uh, you know, or, or Cabejo, or Fatima? Here we go. We're going to shortly talk about these. The purpose of the message that God wants us to learn out of all of these warnings and chastisements is this. The future is not irrevocably set. Yes, God knows what will happen and everything is under the providence of God. He has foreknowledge of what will happen, but he's giving us a chance with our free will to turn back to him, like Mary said at Fatima. If you pray and repent, these terrible things won't happen. But if you don't turn back to God, then this greater war will happen, and it did, World War II. All right, so the message is the future is not irrevocably set. We can change we can change this chastisement with our prayers and penance and fasting and save souls if we answer the call of Our Lady. All right, let's look at a couple of these. I'm gonna read these to you. At Akita, these were a series of miracles and locutions reported by a lady by the name of Sister Agnes Sasagawa. And it was this, it was in Japan, and she said basically these, or if you want to summarize it, the warnings were basically of terrible chastisement, but also assurance that we can avert that or mitigate that chastisement with prayer, especially the rosary, penance, and sacrifices. Well, Father, you're getting me down here. You're scaring me. No, I want to wake it in you. <clears throat> an act of faith, <clears throat> excuse me, that prays, that does penance, that, that turns back to God so we can save souls and avoid this chastisement. We're in the, in, in the army right now. This is a battle that's coming. Akita talks about it. What does Akita say? Let me read you one passage. As I told you, this is Mary, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. Notice she said, if. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one has never seen before. Fire will fall from the sky, we talked about that, and will wipe out a great part of humanity, we talked about that. The good as well as the bad, spearing neither priests nor faithful, the survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary. So not guns, not nuclear weapons. The weapon is the rosary. And the sign left by my son. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the pope, the bishops, and priests. We need that now more than ever. All right, the next one. I'm sorry I can't spend more time on these, but La Salette, what happened there? Okay, this was Our Lady appearing um, to a young lady named Melanie, and she basically said, and this is again going back to the saints and what was said and reported at La Salette. After all these will have arrived, many will recognize the hand of God, and they will convert and do penance for their sins. Talking about after some chastisement. A great king will go up on the throne. Remember back in the five stages, we talked about there'd be a great monarch or a great leader that would unite with the Pope. That's consistent with what was said at La Salette. A great king or leader will go up on the throne and will reign a few years. Religion will flourish. This is just like the era of great peace, the reign of the Immaculate Heart, and spread all over the world, and there will be great abundance. The world, glad not to be lacking nothing, however, will then fall back again into disorder, just like I said, sometimes when we get prosperity, we forget our need for God. 
and they will give up God and will be prone to its criminal passions. If they do not do penance, again, notice Mary says if, if they do not do penance and they do not cease working on Sunday and if they continue to blaspheme the holy name of God in a word, if the face of the earth does not change, God will be avenged against the people that are ungrateful and enslaved to the demons. This is not a mean, vengeful God. This is a God allowing us to ourselves. All right, let's go to the next one, Cabejo. This one is also um, in Rwanda, an appearing of Our Lady, and here's what was said to a, a group of seers. The world, Mary said, conducts itself very badly. The world hastens to its ruin. It will fall into the abyss. In other words, plunged into innumerable and unrelenting disasters. The world is rebellious against God. It commits too many sins. It has neither love nor peace. If, notice again, if you do not repent and do not convert your hearts, you will fall into the abyss. When was this? May 15th, 1982. And Mary said to those visionaries, especially Natalie, one of the visionaries, no one will reach heaven without suffering. Suffering is both a means of compensating for the sins of the world and participating in Jesus and Mary's sufferings that were at the cross for the salvation of the world. Wow. This is a wake-up call. All right. It is both a means of compensating and a means of atoning for sins of us and our whole world. All right, let's keep going. There's been a lot of prophecy, like Our Lady of Good Success is one of my favorites. Here, this is what Sister um, reported, it was reported to a nun um, in Ecuador back in the 1600s. Mary said to her, Our Lady of Good Success, Again, a powerful, powerful devotion. Thus, I make it known to you that shortly after the middle of the 20th century, which is what we just lived through, the passions will erupt and there will be a total corruption of morals. As for the sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ and his church, it will be attacked and deeply profaned. Freemasonry, which will then be in power, will enact iniquitous laws with the aim of doing away with the sacrament of marriage, making it easy for everyone to live in sin and encouraging procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church. In this supreme moment of need for the church, the one who would speak or should speak will fall silent. All right. Wow. To me, we have to understand these are just the words of the saints. Please take them to heart. It's not to upset you or to scare you or to get you depressed. It's for us to pray for the world. All right, now, I'd, I'm not going to go into a couple things, but I'd like to touch on them. Like, for instance, Gara Bindal. A lot of people ask me about that. I'm just going to say this. The local bishops have said that they do not find evidence for it to be supernatural. However, it's not condemned. It's not a full condemn. I should say fully. It's not a full condemnation. Simply a statement that evidence is lacking. So it is not established as supernatural, but then again, it is not condemned. Medjugorje. Many of people, you wrote to me when I mentioned Medjugorje last week. I, I commend Mary TV and, and the great work that they're doing. I've seen more fruits come out of Medjugorje. I've met more priests that come out of Medjugorje than any other vocations that come from a particular devotion. I personally saw the fruit. I, I've experienced Eucharistic miracles in Medjugorje. A girl who talked to me for 45 minutes and I found out later she didn't speak English. I heard her in English. She only spoke Ukrainian. These are the kind of miracles that go on there. But what I have to say about Medjugorje is this. Yes, you are right. It is not fully approved. No official Vatican ruling has been made on its authenticity. All right, now, authority though, for the first time ever, has been removed from the local bishop. So those of you who say, Father, the local bishops reject it, it doesn't matter because the authority does not rest here with the local bishops. It was given to the Holy See. 
And the Holy See, the Vatican, now says clerics can visit and lead pilgrimages there. The Rooney Report, the commissioned Rooney Report, which leaked out in May of 2017, had a majority vote in favor of the authenticity of the first seven apparitions of Medjugorje, but no conclusion about the authenticity of subsequent apparitions. Now, Archbishop Luigi Pizzuto, who is the apostolic nuncio to Bosnia Herzegovina, so please don't tell me, Father, everybody has rejected and condemned Medjugorje because he is the nuncio to that region. And he said, quote, we are on a pilgrimage that brings us to this Marian destination, St. James Church, as the temple of the Queen of Peace. And he refers to Mary as the Queen of Divine Mercy. Now, Pizzuto is the representative of the Holy See speaking favorably of Medjugorje. But yes, I'm not gonna say it's approved fully, it's not, but Archbishop Hoser, who is the Archbishop assigned to Medjugorje by the Vatican, has said the Pope has opened a great door to enter Medjugorje, this is him speaking, with his May 12, 2019 decree, adding that he was personally and intimately convinced that the Marian Center in Medjugorje offered a model for new evangelization. So please go visit Mary TV to see some of that. All right, we're gonna finish now with the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. You see on your screen, why do we wanna talk about this? This was critically important because as I said, in 1884, Pope Leo, after celebrating mass, overheard a conversation between Christ and Satan. Satan said, I can bring down your church. And Jesus said, you think so? And um, the sa Satan said, yes, but I need more time and I need more power. He said, how much power? He said, enough to persuade the lukewarm sinner. He said, how much time? He said, about a hundred years. Now, some say the 100-year reign of Satan began in 1884 and went to 1984, which happened to be the um, consecration of um, the, uh, the, the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Some say that, like Father Apostoli, that the 100-year reign of Satan started in 1884 when Leo XIII overheard this conversation and ended in 1984. Now, if John Paul II consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in 1984, which he did, this is believable. But some say the 100-year reign of Satan began in 1917, because in that time, Satan launched several attacks. World War I was raging, the Masonic bankers took their first country in Russia, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, uh, launched her series. Uh, she made a movie called Birth Control. Um, but remember, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Let's look at your next slide. Here's Pius XII and Benedict XV. Why are they important? Because Pius XII was made a bishop in the Sistine Chapel, guess when? May 13th, 1917, the very day Mary appeared in Fatima, and this is the Pope that led us through World War II. Incredible. <clears throat> what about Pope Benedict XV, who you saw on your screen? He was doing a novena to Mary, the mother of mercy, for peace. And that peace that he was praying for, Mary appeared on the eighth day of his novena, guess when? Also on May 13th, 1917. So Mary came on that day, which seems to be God's answer to all these evils, like World War I and, and the Masonic bankers and the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, all right? So Mary came on this May 13th, which was actually the feast of Our Lady of the Eucharist. So we have tools to fight this battle. God's giving us his own mother, the sacraments like the Eucharist. Now, this last hundred years have been a time of unprecedented sin. 
So it may make sense that if 1917 is when Satan launched his attack, look at the last hundred years. I mean, just divorce uh, almost on, in, on so many families, contraception, a legalized abortion, um, test two babies, open um, redefinition of marriage, uh, instant access pornography, corruption of higher education, um, indoctrination of the youth, welfare states, crippling debt, rejection of our constitution, stripping of our freedoms, embracing of Marxism, acceptance of violence as a form of protest, yet no one's accountable, everybody's a victim, there is no hell and everybody will go to heaven. This is crazy. This is what's been going on. You know, the Cardinal told St. Lucy that the final battle between God and Satan would be over marriage and the family. This is so important. Mary asked what to be done. She asked the three children to pray and do penance to never offend God again. This is Fatima. Mary said, pray the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war. This is what Fatima is all about. So look at your screen. After being shot, just weeks apart from Ronald Reagan, John Paul II asked for the third secret of Fatima and the diary of St. Faustina. And here's the amazing miracle of Fatima. The next slide. What good could come out of this? John Paul II began to make explicit the connection between divine mercy and Fatima. He said, Mary's immaculate conception is the greatest gift of God's mercy. That's why we, the Marians of the immaculate conception, are all about God's mercy. And it is Mary and divine mercy that are the two spiritual weapons of our time. This, he said, is the end goal of the message of Fatima, to bring us to God's divine mercy. All right, John Paul II said the triumph of the Immaculate Heart will be when we allow her to wash us in the fountain of divine mercy, which she's able to do when we are consecrated to her. So consecrate to Mary if you haven't already. He said the triumph will happen when man turns, listen to this, with trust. This is the diary of St. Faustina. To Jesus and through Mary's intercession in prayer and penance for the sins of the world. John Paul recognized that there would only be peace through this message, this message of Fatima and St. Faustina. This is what paragraph 699 talks about. Mankind will not have peace until it turns with trust to God's mercy. So how do we bring in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart? Don't despair, trust, have hope. This whole message I'm giving you today is about hope. It is a message that says we can make a difference through prayer and turning back to God, that we don't have to go through these trials of horrible chastisements if we choose God instead. This is the message. St. John Bosco, look at your next slide there, one of my favorite saints, said, I foresee that some of the greatest trials of the Catholic Church's history await her in the next century. Woo, that's time is now. God is giving only two means to defend his church. The first is devotion to Jesus and the most blessed sacrament, and the second is devotion to Our Lady. Again, Jesus and Mary. These are the two tools. All right. We are still waiting, though, for the complete conversion of Russia. And I got letters on this, and I want to address it. All right. The conversion of Russia and the world, really, with Mary in this time of mercy. All right. We can right now draw down an ocean of mercy upon us and the whole world by doing things like praying the chaplet. This is what God asked. John Paul said this is the final message of Fatima, that we can draw mercy upon ourselves and the world in the way that we can prepare the world for his final coming. This all ties together through Marian consecration and Divine Mercy Sunday, our soul will never be cleaner than it is other than the moment of our original baptism than it is on Divine Mercy Sunday. If you want to learn more about that, I have other talks. This is the way laid out by Christ and the saints like Faustina and John Paul, and it just, it's beautiful. All right. 
If Russia hasn't been converted, everybody is telling me that means, Father, that means Russia was not consecrated. If Russia hasn't been converted, it hasn't been consecrated. But in order for Russia to be converted, she, yes, had to be consecrated. But there had to be something else that happened too. So here's the big point. Everybody who says, Father, Russia has not been consecrated because we don't see a conversion of Russia has forgotten one important part. Mary said two things need to happen before the conversion of Russia. One is its consecration, which you and I have no control over. But the second, look up on your screen, is the five first Saturdays devotion. Mary said to do the five first Saturday devotions. What are they? For five consecutive months on the first Saturday, pray the, ro or I should say, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, or if you can't get to church, in lieu of a uh, confession, make an act of contrition, and in lieu of communion, make a spiritual communion. Pray the rosary and meditate on one or more of the mysteries for an additional 15 minutes. You do that for five consecutive first Saturdays, and Mary said we can change the world. Sister Lucia said, let's go back to this consecration. The consecration, let's read what Sister Lucia said. So was Mary or was Russia consecrated? Let's read. Had made the consecration in the way in which the Blessed Virgin had wished that it should be made. Afterward, people asked me if it was made in the way Our Lady wanted, and I replied, yes, from that time it is made. But here's the problem. It was late. It was late. So we have to understand, if Russia hasn't seen a conversion yet, it's because two things needed to happen. The consecration, which the Vatican is saying did happen, but also five first Saturdays. So I ask you, before you send me comments saying, Father, I'm wrong, that Russia wasn't consecrated, ask yourself if you've done the five first Saturdays, because that's also needed in order for us to see a conversion of Russia. All right, now, not long afterwards, after that consecration in 1984 of the world of the Immaculate Heart, which John Paul did say he meant to include Russia, later in 1991, the USSR collapsed. On June 26, 2000, the church stated, quote, Sister Lucia personally confirmed that this solemn and universal act of consecration corresponded to what Our Lady wished. Yes, it has been done just as Our Lady asked on March 25th, 1984, when John Paul consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart. Hence, any further discussion or request is without basis. All right, to wrap up here, you guys have been great. Mary said, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me. But remember, it was late. We didn't do it when Mary first asked, and that's why Russia spread her errors. Father, it wasn't consecrated. That's why Russia spread the errors. No, Russia spread the errors because we were late. It was consecrated late. She said, the Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me and she shall be converted and a period of peace will be granted to the world. We just talked about that era of peace, stage three. You can go back in the video, hear what I said about that a few minutes back. So pray very much for the Holy Father, she said. He will do it, but it will be late and Russia's ears will spread. Nevertheless, the Immaculate Heart of Mary will save Russia because it is entrusted to her. God bless that, right? And so to finish, experts from the world apostolate of Fatima said that the 1984 consecration had said the world because by that time, Russia had already spread her errors. So by 1984, not just Russia needed consecrating, but the whole world needed consecrating because of her errors. And that's why John Paul II said the world. All right, so the last two slides, what is Mary asking us to do in all of these devotions? Fatima, Akita, La Salette. What is Mary asking us, Cabejo? What is she asking us to do? You can summarize it right here. 
You want one slide to get all the messages of Marian apparitions, there you go. One, consecration and living consecration to Mary. Two, pray the rosary every day. Three, personal conversion by a daily examination of conscience and frequent confession. Four, a Eucharistic life, mass and Eucharistic adoration as often as possible. Five, fasting. Six, accepting your own cross. I talked about that in my homily yesterday if you didn't see it. What you did not choose, do not like, and cannot change. I love that. That's how you accept your own cross. Accept it with trust and unite it to the cross of Jesus to defeat Satan and save souls. And finally, number seven, lead people to Mary who will lead them to Jesus. God bless you. Now let's read to finish here St. John Paul II and what he said about the end times. You may have heard this quote, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of the American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church of the gospel versus the anti-gospel. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence, meaning God allows it. It is trial which the whole church and the Polish church in particular must take up. It is a trial of not only our nation and the church, but in a sense, a test. And the powerful thing for me to understand this passage this passage is that, yes, we are being tested, but we have, through the mercy of God, the opportunity to change this chastisement and this justice of God by turning to his mercy because God's mercy triumphs over his justice. So, Father, you gave me a real downer today. No. I gave you reality. Father, you scared me today. No, we should give you joy and hope because every day we're closer to the coming of Christ, to the reign of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the second coming of Christ, and for us to be with him in all eternity. In the meantime, what is your job? Same as my job. Prayer, penance, fasting if you're able, whatever we can do for the salvation of souls, this way we make atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. We hold back the hand of God's justice. We shower his mercy upon the world. We save our souls and the souls of our loved ones. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why God wants us to know about the end times and to know how to turn to him in prayer, penance, fasting, and whatever we can do to give of our will to God's will, so that we may be happy with him for all eternity. Amen. God bless all of you, and please join us next week as we talk about purgatory and why it is biblical and why it's church teaching. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, and thank you for joining us. Many of us are aware of the statistics regarding the coronavirus but probably far fewer of us are aware of the mental health impact from such things such as depression and anxiety that may be affecting you or the ones you love. Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. You know, what has been happening in recent months is quite alarming. People are showing up at healthcare clinics and hospitals to receive counseling or treatment for issues, as I said, such as depression and anxiety. But unfortunately, there are many of them are being turned away for fear of catching the coronavirus. The result is over an increase of 600% in the number of calls to suicide hotlines. Although we do not have the full statistics in yet, 
Professionals are warning us that the number of suicides are greatly increasing. In fact, the number of suicides in many areas are outpacing the number of deaths due to coronavirus. We at the Marian Fathers here want to help you and the ones you love. Please consider getting one of these resources that we offer, such as this book by myself and brother Jason Lewis called After Suicide, There's Hope for Them, meaning the salvation of their soul, and for you, meaning those left behind. It's an opportunity for us to teach you why there is hope in the mercy of God, even in the midst of tragedy. And it isn't just suicide, although the title uses suicide because it's one of the hardest examples to deal with. This book handles the spiritual principles to get you through any kind of loss, be it the loss of a loved one of any kind, such as natural causes or cancer, even the loss of something you love, like a relationship. We give you the spiritual guides of how to get through such tough times and get through another day. The book is now also available in Spanish for those of you who are Spanish speakers who may also need such resources. So please visit our website, suicideandhope.com, where there you can get these books or find other resources to help you and your loved ones get through such tragedies. There is also an opportunity for you on that website to enter in the name of your loved ones that you have lost. You can put just a first name, a full name, even initials, and you don't have to identify yourself or your email or name at all. But I will personally pray for each and every one of those names entered on this website and offer masses for all those souls. Again, please visit suicideandhope.com to memorialize your loved one and to find many resources to help us get through these very troubled times. Thank you and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Suicide has gone up every year over the last 10 years, 30% in total. Um, I mentioned to you before the show that there's more people in the world every year now recently that take their own lives than all the wars or homicides combined. 